Margot, it's always good to see you. Good to see you again. Uh, congratulations on the film. I, Tanya is the film. Um, this one has had a, a, a nice little ride since Toronto. I mean, mm -hmm. You only debuted a couple months ago and mm -hmm. get distribution. Suddenly it's in the awards conversation, not necessarily the thing you count on for a film about Tanya Harding. So congratulations all around. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a quick turnaround. I mean, we were still shooting in March of this year. So Amazing. the fact that everyone's now seeing it and, and chatting about it, it's great. So talk to me a little bit about like the fact that we have a biopic about Tanya Harding. Because you know when I think like biopics, generally you're thinking like world leaders, you're thinking Gandhi, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Like Tanya Harding is doesn't fit that mold. Yeah, um, she's uh, yeah, not the most uh, traditional person to do a biopic on, but we, it's not really a traditional biopic either. So yeah, definitely the unconventional quality to the structure of our film and the tone of it. And I think that kind of reflects Tanya herself and her story. What do you think people need to know about, I mean, I knew a lot about the story, like I kind of grew up with it. I know you didn't know necessarily much at all. Nothing, What yeah. do you think people need to know about what Tanya and Jeff's life was going into this, or can they go in kind of cold, you think? I mean, you can go in cold, either way you're going to be swept up on the ride because it is, the story and the circumstances are at times totally bizarre, totally hilarious, totally tragic, sad. They're just, uh, you know, these characters are very, not speaking about the people specifically, but the characters in the film are very misunderstood and, and that is a reflection of the people in real life. No one really knew their backstories, what was going on behind the headlines. They just had these splashy headlines and constant sound bites that kind of told the world to hate these people without really knowing much about them or what was going on. So yeah. our film kind of gives you different perspectives on what was happening and kind of plays with the idea of truth and how everyone has their own version of truth. So uh, you have Tonya's version of the story and you have Jeff, her husband, well then ex-husband, his version of the story too, and they totally contradict one another. So it's quite hilarious at times and we're not exactly putting a stamp being like, this is exactly what happened. We're just sure. saying, this is what they said and this is what they said and... Well, that's what real life is, right? Will. Like there, there's, there's not a one objective truth. We all have our own set of facts that we're going to cling to and somewhere Especially in the Especially years later, like it's yeah. decades later and I think people remember things in a different way sure. when they've had time to really consider it. Is, is that something like in a weird way that you relate to? I mean, when you started to become a public figure, and I'm sure this happens to this day, you probably start to see headlines that are just blatantly not true about yeah. you and that some of them just don't die, they just go on Wikipedia and you're asked about it forever. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any that still either amuse you or bother you to this day that kind of keep popping up about you? I mean, every five seconds someone says I'm pregnant, which is just impossible. Um, it's gone from being like, oh, she's having an affair with this person to this person. I was like, I don't even have time to wash my hair, let alone have all these affairs. And now that I'm married, it's like, well, she's pregnant all the time, like all the time. So, <laughs> I mean, that's mildly amusing. Um, but, but yeah, no, I recently, I, I, I feel like you can say the most innocent or innocuous thing and it will be turned into big, like, right. breaking news. She has a meltdown. It's about absolutely nothing. Yeah, sarcasm sometimes cannot read well. Yeah, yeah, I, I should just be, yeah, very concise <laughs> very earnest, and very... boring and, <laughs> no, no. yeah. Um, I was saying this to Sebastian. I mean, I've noticed this about both of kind of like, you know, the people that, that are admirers of your work. You've got really fervent fans. Like, even by, by like, the standards of public figures, I've yeah. noticed this about both of your fan bases, if you want to call them that. Does, does the Margot Robbie fan, fans have a specific name that you enjoy or that you assign? Not that I know of. Okay, it's time, I feel like. We, not, we might Maybe need to there is one, on I don't know about it, but. Is, is, that, is that something that you feel like, like what's the line for you in terms of, I mean, it must be wonderful to kind of receive love when you kind of like are walking in the street and someone recognizes you, but at a certain point you also want to need to live your life and just sort of you want to maintain some kind yeah, of privacy. Yeah, set some sort of boundaries. What, is there like a line in the sand for you that you've tried to kind of figure out or? or... I mean, you try to, but it's this job, it's a very like fluid sort of lifestyle. You're never really in one spot. You're always moving around. You're always working on different projects, different characters. It's really hard to set yourself these little boundaries and rules because they just end up being thrown out the window anyway. I mean, I try and be like, I'm going to keep my personal life and my work life separate. It's impossible. Like, I can't. Like, I work with my best friends. Work and personal are already intermixed. So, um, as far as, like, how to set boundaries with, with public persona, I suppose. Yeah, I, yeah I, d I don't know. I guess kind of just go with the flow and try and 
do it by a case by case basis. Um, shifting gears a little bit back to, to the nature of the film, did you have, like growing up, was there a sport that you uh, dreamed that you could make the Olympics in? Was there something that you felt you had an aptitude in? I, I mean, as far as Olympic sports that I watched on the TV, I was always fascinated by pole vaulting. I just couldn't understand, like, the physics of it. I thought that was pretty wild. Um, that feels like a real, like, a celebrity thing to do now, is, like, you have, like, a personal, like, pole vault coach. Yeah, I just do pole vaulting like, as a hobby now. Right. No, insurance would never <laughs> let you. I mean, as long as you're under contract, you can't even do, like, jet skiing. Like, right. you can't do anything. So pole vaulting would probably <laughs> be on out. that list. Okay. Um, but, no, ice hockey was, uh, I mean, that's an Olympic sport. But, yeah, I, I always wanted to play ice hockey when I was a kid. So w for this one, obviously, there's some CG magic because mm -hmm. the stuff that Tanya does, virtually no figure skater still can do. Yeah. Um, um, was there a plan B if like you got on the ice and like you were just super shitty at skating? Like how did you know you had basic skills? There was or? not a plan B. It was just like a <laughs> get there and get there fast. And I was right. like, ah, it, it was a lot harder than I thought. I normally can pick up things fairly quickly. Like if it's something I'm learning for a film. I mean, the greatest thing about a film is you get to pick up all these cool new skills and you get amazing coaches to show you how to do it. Like when I did Focus, I had like a real life pickpocket showing right. me how to pickpocket, you know. There's, there's all that kind of stuff, which is amazing. But in this instance, I, I think I underestimated how difficult ice skating really is. And um, I mean, we got there in the end, but it took a, a lot of training, like a lot. You uh, produced this film, and I know mm -hmm. you, we were talking when you sat down, you, your, your production company's moving. Like there's a lot in the pipeline yeah. that's, that's happening in yeah. a, a short period of time. So congrats on that. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm curious, like, you know, the, uh, on the negative side of like the, the, the narrative of this year around Hollywood are these like, you know, parboled men that have abused their power. And like mm -hmm. the, uh, one of the solutions I think we can all agree is just sort of like getting women into those positions of power where they can make the decisions and even the playing field mm -hmm. a bit. So mm -hmm. you're doing your part clearly in that aspect. I mean, was that part of kind of the reason to do it as a I mean, I'm sure there's a reason to like create projects for yourself, but is it also kind of like finding opportunities for friends and people that you trust or, or what? Totally. And I mean, it, the, the idea of the company really came years ago and obviously years before all the recent events, but it, it was always an idea to promote female filmmakers and female, female roles. And it didn't really make sense to be like, let's have more female roles always directed by guys. That didn't make sense. It's like sometimes you want, right. not necessarily always, but sometimes you need a female's voice telling that character's story. So yeah, the idea was to have as many female filmmakers, you know, working on a project with a female voice and female characters at the center of it. Is it important to you, for you going forward, that like, you know, Harley is obviously a character that you, you embraced and loved and mm -hmm. hopefully will be playing again soon. I know you're attached as a producer to at least one of the potential projects. Would mm -hmm. you definitely produce the next incarnation of Harley on the screen? Yeah, I've been working on it for two years now. Oh, amazing. I mean, it's it's hard to kind of talk about it because all this stuff sure. is kind of like under lock and key. But yeah, no, I've been working on a separate uh, spin-off Harley thing for a while now. Got it. So, and I know it's super early days, but just so I can get my head straight, because there's been talk of like the Harley Joker film and mm -hmm. the Gotham City Sirens. Are those two distinct things? Are you talking about the Sirens project? No, there? it's a totally separate one. Oh my gosh, okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot <laughs> going awesome. on right okay. now, and I'm not sure. I honestly, I don't think anyone knows what's going to be the next thing to yeah. happen, but I think everyone's keen to get Harley back on screen, and so everyone's Absolutely. working on lots of different versions of what that could be. You know, what are you itching to do with that character that you weren't able to do the first time around? I want to see her with other women women. I yeah. was like, I kept saying it when we were shooting Suicide Squad, I was like, she needs her girlfriends. Like, she needs she needs other girls around her because she loves that. You see it in the comics. She, she loves meeting people, any people, but but she needs like, she needs a little girl gang. Was there a learning that, that, that you took out of kind of the whole experience of Suicide Squad, which obviously, that was a unique one in terms of like how you bonded with the cast and you loved working with David, I know. Mm -hmm. And People loved your incarnation of the character. There was mixed opinion about the film itself, as mm -hmm. you well know. Is mm -hmm. there a learning you take going forward the next time you get into kind of that scale of filmmaking with that character? I think when it comes to something that has such a huge fan base already, you obviously want to do the fans justice. You want to you want to show them the characters that they fell in love with, but you also can't be kind of paralyzed by the idea of how do we please everyone? Because it's just not going to happen with any film. I mean, with doing Tonya as well, it was like, you know, this is someone that everyone really knows well and has already passed judgment on. But if we sit here and, and forget to tell the story or forget to find the truth in a scene or a scenario right. we're, and, and just trying to make everyone happy, you're never going to please everyone. So all you can do is 
try and tell the truth as much as possible. Have, have truthful reactions and truthful scenarios for your character. Know your character inside out and then let people watch them inhabit the world. Right. And I guess that would be the approach with Harley as well. There's another film that's come up associated with you is Quentin Tarantino's potential upcoming project. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you're definitely going to do? You're con considering right now or what? I uh, There's nothing official. Okay. Um, despite all the headlines, there's nothing officially set, but I, I adore Tarantino and I um, would do anything to work with him. So yes, big, big Tarantino fan. That would be a dream come true. Okay, no, fair enough, fair enough. So I mean, uh, talk to me a little bit, just circling, coming full circle on uh, an experience like I, Tanya. Um, what do you get out of an experience like this that you apply to the next one? And this is this is a transformative kind of a role. Mm -hmm. It's you know I don't know if you leave your producing hat when you get on set, but like what are the lessons or when you think back to this experience, what's going to be the takeaway for you? It's different in every scenario. I mean, in every film I've done, acting or producing or whatever, it's 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 always a learning experience. You always figure out things that you apply for the next time round and you it's the same with every single film I've ever done I'm learning all the time and hopefully getting better all the time but yeah it, it's it's definitely the first few films that I've acted in I've done three now that I've acted in and produced simultaneously and I am definitely figuring out okay what things should I step back and not be involved in at particular moments because I don't want to um, you know you don't want to be looking over budgets or something when you need to be concentrating right. on an emotional scene. So just finding the right times to do that and the right ways to communicate and delegate has been has been interesting and something I'm figuring out as we go along. I, I did it the first time around. We produced a film before Tonya. Right. And then I knew kind of like, okay, now I know how I want to produce Tonya. I know the moments to step in, step out, and sure. um, yeah, be able to give my 100% to the, to the character and to the director. You, a director doesn't want an actor running off ice to like, to figure out, the, to the figure out if we're going overtime today, right, right, like right. it's like, no, just do the do scene. Job. Yeah. yeah, and then after <laughs> hours, then I get to stay back for another couple hours and do the producing stuff. Nice. And, and last thing, on the, the, tonally speaking, which I know is a word that comes up with every film, but particularly in this one, like, because, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it speaks to, you were talking about sort of like, you know, honoring the story and not necessarily, you have to, you want to honor like the truth uh, of the situation, but in something like this, you have to tell the story mm -hmm. that you're telling. And this one balances a lot of tones. Uh, just talk to me a little bit about like the relief when you saw with critics and audiences that this worked, because I would imagine there's some, some worry before you start to screen this, if it's going to kind of... Totally. There's no one I can hide behind with I, Tonya that it was like, well, that wasn't my decision. It's like I was very heavily involved in every aspect of it. So yeah. I can't like, if people don't like it, it's, it's a lot of that blame goes to me. So I was so scared, more scared than I've ever been for a film to come out and, and to see if people liked it, critics and the public alike. So um, yeah, to be at, to be in Toronto and to like feel the, the, the hype around it and then and then that scared me because I was like hype's not a good thing right. if you're gonna like let people Sound down so yeah. yeah so when there was the positive reaction from critics and people I was like I mean first we got like great reviews come in and I was like oh my goodness this is the best thing ever and I was like but do the people like it and we like ran the first thing next morning we ran to the public screenings and we saw that people had lined up like around the block to go see it and we were like yes right. and now I sing on the cake the actual public out there yes. gets to see it so yes. uh, congratulations again on this one always Thank uh, enjoyed catching up with you and uh, I'll see you on the next one. I'll I see guess. you on the next one. Thanks.